welcome back to Uncharted X. This is Ben, and the video I want to share today is a follow-up to my recent content diving into the detailed scanning of an ancient Egyptian pre-dynastic granite vase. If you haven't seen my previous videos on this, I'd highly recommend checking them out first, as they introduce the topic and explain the scanning procedure, which accurately mapped the vase down to the thousandth of an inch, or in metric terms, down to the micrometer, which are thousandths of a millimetre. The scan was analysed by professional metrologists and aerospace engineers Alex Dunn and Nick Sierra. And in those videos we discussed the precision evident in the vase, its geometry, the incredible challenge of machining such a piece from solid granite, and frankly the absurdity of any notion that this might have been achieved with primitive hand tools in ancient times. As remarkable as our results and analysis were, in reality, we were but standing on the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what we could learn by studying this ancient granite vessel. Today, I want to share with you the astonishing results from a more detailed investigation into the vase scan and show you just how deep the rabbit hole truly goes on the topic of ancient technology. One of our objectives from the start of this project was to open source our results, which is exactly what we did. And the vase scan STL file can be downloaded by anyone from my website at unchartedx.com. Our hope was to leverage the power of a community of interested and talented people to aid in the analysis of the results. And this is exactly what happened. The scan was investigated by a talented cryptographer and mathematician, Mark, who runs the unsigned.io website. And his work and conclusions are truly revelatory and should shock anyone with an open-minded interest in the study of our past and that of ancient civilizations. What's more, this isn't a case of just some random speculation. It's fact, and it's backed up by data. Anyone with the know-how can replicate the result of Mark's work for themselves. He undertook a mathematical analysis of the vase's geometry, and the results are so astonishing that they should provide the basis for the study of many more artifacts, if not trigger a re-evaluation of what we think we know about ancient civilizations altogether. I want to extend a public and heartfelt thank you to Mark and his colleagues for the many days, likely weeks, of effort that went into this work. So, let's get into it. The clip I'm going to play was cut from one of my recent Twitch streams discussing the vase. I stream over there a couple of times a week at twitch.tv slash unchartedx if you want to catch me live. Links to the article and videos are in the description box below, and I'll be back at the end of the clip with some more thoughts and to talk about how we're going to move forward with this scanning project. So stick around for that if you're interested. If you guys have not seen this, I would highly recommend unsigned. So you can see the URL unsigned.io, and then you'll probably find a link to this. Um, but what I kind of wanted to talk about, I mean, I do want to go through this in in my podcast, but maybe we can run through it here. But so this was the this was the Danish cryptographer Mark, mathematician and cryptographer who. Did the anal did like a, f a much deeper mathematical analysis of the vase scan. So if you guys have seen recently, the work on the channel was a lot of it was surrounding the the, sc the, the scanning of this pre dynastic vase, right? So in terms of size, it's about this big, right? This is a three D printed version. I've got a few of them, um, but the vase is about that big. So like six seven inches ish tall. Um, that's more or less its shape, but even the, the scan has the damage that's on the lip and stuff. It's it's pretty good, and and we scanned it with a you know structured light scanner, and and the videos with Alex Dunn, Chris Dunn's son, and, and Nick Sierra, these professional metrologists and and aerospace engineers, we focus a lot on the precision machining. We talk about that, and they and they used CMM software to uh, define kind of a lot of the, the geometric precision and relativity of different areas of the vase to each other. Now, Mark went much deeper than that. He took the scan and um, and did a mathematical analysis of it. And then we're not going to we don't have to dive into the math. There's a few things that, that come out of this. All right, one of one of them is that the vase can be represented essentially with a single algorithm, and and he it's been reverse engineered to the point where this is much more than just a simple object it's 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 telling a story it's telling a story about the capabilities of the of the people who made it and in fact 
and, and, and about their understanding of the universe and some fundamental principles of nature and things like sacred geometry. Like all of these things are reflected in this vase. And in fact, it, it even tells a story about potentially what their whole system of mathematics might have been, which if you think about our maths today, we use a base 10 system. You know, base 16 is hexadecimal, but we generally use like, you know, base 10. These guys probably using a version of mathematics that was more like base radian or base pi, um, which is much more closely oriented to like sacred geometry and the structure of the universe and using radians and, and a mathematical system based on radians. So what's a radian? A radian, there's a, probably a picture of a radian here. Um, uh, does he have a picture of a radian here? No. Okay. So a, a radian is is it's a it's a way of defining an angle. So we use an arbitrary kind of three hundred sixty degree angle. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. We could try it in binary too. Sure. Um, zeros and ones. But um, so radians it's a universal way to describe angles, right? It's basically you take the radius of a circle. You know, which a fundamental principle part of a circle that's half of its diameter. You 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 draw that length on the on the circumference of a circle. You make it you make a triangle out of it, and the angle that it forms in the center is one radian, right? So it's based on that you can define any angle as a in terms of radians, right? So as he says here, radians are based on the fundamental ratio between the radius and circumference of a circle. Whereas degrees is just an arbitrary subdivision of a circle into 360 pieces. As such, it is not based on any fundamental mathematical ratios or constants and not really useful in, in any analysis such as this. Radians are useful because they show the underlying mathematical relations more clearly. Radians may lead to some unease if you're not familiar with them. Fear not, though. It's actually simpler and much more intuitive than using degrees. All you need to know is that there are two by pi radians in a circle and pi radians in a triangle. For example, a 45-degree angle is pi over 4 radians. You can describe any angle by simple fractions of pi. So what he did, let's see, I, I want to get to, he created a model of it, right? So to explore what kinds of design principles were used in the creation of the object, we start out by measuring and mapping as many features of the object as possible and looking for repeating patterns of placement and dimensioning and repeating or mathematically significant ratios. While we initially did not understand the underlying principles of what we found, it was clear that patterns and persistent ratios were present in overwhelming abundance throughout the object. Not only were they present, but they exhibited such a high degree of regularity that we suspected them to be derived from well-defined mathematical formulae. This led us to attempting something that really should not have been possible when dealing with a supposedly ancient artifact made from granite, of all things. We decided to experimentally build a CAD model that would exclusively use mathematical concepts to dimension and place the features of the object and use no, no tuning or arbitrary positional adjustments. All features should be placed and dimensioned by interrelation to each other. We also limited the initial margin of error tolerance of the model to 75 micrometers in terms of how well it should map to the features of the object. This margin of error tolerance was, amongst other things, used to discern whether an attempted modeling of a particular feature should be considered for inclusion in the model or rejected. I find it timely to stress how completely ludicrous this actually is. We're dealing with a stone vessel of supposedly ancient design and are now proposing that a purely mathematical CAD model should somehow map to the actual object within a tolerance of less than 75 thousandths of a millimeter. Like that's 75 thousandths of a millimeter. Yet I will let the results speak for themselves. Additionally, the CAD model and all of its constituent equations are available for verification for anyone interested in doing so. So what he's saying is that he, that based on their mathematical analysis of the object and, the, and the, the algorithms it seems to represent, they created a CAD model based purely on the mathematics and then compared it to the actual model. And it was within this level of tolerance. Like, this is amazing. Like, this, this is... Amazing. So one of the, the patterns that they came up with was something called, and, and this is like when they reverse engineered it to find the mass, they found something that they're calling the radial transversal pattern, right? The most widely used primitive in the object is the circle. Circles or arcs thereof 
are used to define most of the features of the object, and all circular features in the object have radii that are interrelated with incredible consistency and precision. There is, in fact, one single and elegant equation governing the dimensioning of almost all circles utilized in the design. The few circles not following this pattern have been specifically chosen to display some very significant numbers, which we will get to shortly. So the few circles that don't fit this are ones that show pi, phi, golden ratio, other sacred geometry elements. But essentially, they came up with what something called a, a radial transversal pattern. With this equation, we can generate all of the relevant radii for shaping the object. We can more easily understand how this equation works by looking at it geometrically. Okay, so already in our early investigation, we noticed that many features seem to be related to a certain geometric construction of unit circles known as the flower of life. We also noticed that not just one, but several of such grids were used. So you can see here these overlapped flowers of life that match. They match to all sorts of different elements and aspects of the vase. So essentially, the um, he goes into some of the, the, the proof of this here, right? Showing you some of the maths behind it, <clears throat> which we don't need to get into. By the continuation of this pattern, we can arrive at the Rn equals this. This is the radial transversal function. And thus, the radii used in the object can be created. So now you have this number of circles, so R4, R3, right down to R minus whatever, right? Since this pattern is used extensively in the object, we will refer to the radial transversal function as Rn and the rest of this article. With this elegant construction, we can account for the majority of the circular features in the object. All of the circles created with this function map to the actual radii of the, ob of the features of the object with incredible precision. So then he talks about the deviation. You're talking about, you know, 70 micrometers maximum. Uh, median radial deviation is only nine thousandths of a millimeter, which is s just silly. So please note that in most radii, even those exhibiting local deviations above the mean, have areas that are, in any meaningful sense of the word, perfect. In many places, the deviation is so small that we cannot say with certainty whether the deviation is due to imperfections in the object or inaccuracies in the scan, which is, again, you're talking thousandths of an inch, thousandths of a millimeter. All radii in the following illustration generated by the Rn function are therefore tightly interrelated. So you can see how they're using these radiuses and these circles based on this function to define different curvature, different parts, uh, different sections of circles, basically, to define the curvature of the vessel. To see this level of consistency of precision across just two or three different radii created from a purely mathematical function would be astonishing. To see it completely consistently to microscopic precision across 12 different radii, measuring from just 1.1 millimeters, that's the, so the smallest circle in that radial transversal model, the smallest diameter or the smallest radius of one of those circles is 1.1 millimeters up to the largest of 42.2 millimeters in a granite artifact is more or less unfathomable. So that's that's mind-boggling. That You have curves in this structure that are defined by sections of a circle that fit that radial transversal algorithm that are so small that the diameter of the circle is only 1.1 millimeters. Like this is, you know, this big, tiny. That's pretty ridiculous. So you have the one radian arc also. So the one radian arc is also, so as a unit is kind of defined um, with a number of, um, uh, in a number of places on the, on the vessel, so it's not just, you know, they're not just this radial transversal function, they're also using and showing their understanding of the of a radian by defining it with, say, these straight lines here, you get a one radian arc. Uh, you get incorporation of pi and phi in these circles here. Um, preliminary evidence of the same, so, you know, we're seeing this sort of stuff here. Incorporation of the golden ratio, that's phi. Um, golden ratio, golden ratio. So what's interesting here, uh, and we get into the handles. Again, one radian arc is, is shown with the handles, uh, single radian arcs, some math included. Now, what's interesting is some of the conclusions that you come to with this, right? So I, I think this is really interesting. It is our conviction that our current model that our current model demonstrates with overwhelming certainty that a high degree of sophisticated design principles and intric intricately interlinked relations and design constraints are present in the object. 
While we cannot tell with certainty if the way that we have described the design exactly matches that of the original creators, we are confident that our reverse engineered model does not indeed represent the actual mathematics or does indeed represent the actual mathematics interrelations and constraints present in the original design. So he's worked he's worked backwards to create to essentially figure out the mathematical system used to define this. While there's still much to learn about this fascinating artifact, the knowledge and data we already have allows us to draw to draw some conclusions with confidence. On chance occurrence. Could an object like this simply have been a chance happening? A rare coincidence of random alignment? No. Proposing that would be completely magical and superstitious thinking. Yeah, right. You could just do this by hand by accident. Now, remember that one one millimeter diameter circle as well, by the way. Maintaining absolute precision and consistency by chance between all the interlinked systems present in the object is, simply put, an impossibility. Waking up one morning with an entirely new universe sprouting from quantum fluctuations in your left nostril would be a significantly more likely event. <laughs> it might be possible by extreme luck to have an object randomly show the value of pi or phi somewhere. But remember that all systems in this object are tightly interrelated. Changing one parameter would throw everything else off. Here, at least 15 levels of inter interrelation exist, and they are all precisely in harmony down to microscopic scales. This object was meticulously and carefully designed by a human being with incredible levels of skills, insight, and artistry. Of that, there can currently be no doubt. Required design capabilities. This, this gets very interesting. This is where I think, this is where that one millimeter thing comes into effect, right? What kind of system would have been necessary to represent the abstract design of the object? So how do you design it before its manufacture? Could the object have been designed by analog means, for example, as a drawing on paper, which was then used to guide the manufacture? To attempt a satisfactory answer to this question, we will need to carefully consider a multitude of factors. A future article will delve into that in full depth. When looking at the scales across which precision was maintained in this object, some interesting problems arise. The smallest radii identified so far in the object are only around one millimeter, but they scale perfectly through the radial trans traversal function with precision in the micrometers to even the largest radii of the object, which is around 63 millimeters. Carrying out this sort of scaling on any kind of analog medium would introduce errors immediately that would only accumulate over successful radial traversals. Even our modern finely tipped drawing tools working on the smoothest of paper would create errors close to the full radii of some of these circles and features. So what he's saying is like, even if you were to draw this out, imagine you took a piece of paper as big as the room you're sitting in, you tried to draw it out. You still then have to scale that thing down to the actual size. And even in doing so, you would introduce significant errors easily to the to to the 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 size of some of the smallest radios which we don't see in the artifact itself like it's precise down to these you know thousands of a millimeter levels to account and control for such errors the designer would have to scale up the blueprint to proportions of at least several meters which of course just raises further questions of how to transfer it back down again to the decidedly petite dimensions of the actual object remember it's about yay big perhaps the most plausible way to represent this object on an analog medium would be to describe it geometrically and mathematically. This is decidedly possible, and one could even make sketches along the way to show an approximation of the final design. Our civilization has known about the required mathematics to do, do this since approximately 500 CE. Right? But being faced with the prospect of then transferring this design through a manufacturing process to a physical object, we are put squarely back to the starting point since we now need to produce some sort of analog template that can guide or control the manufacturing process. So what he's saying is, is that the best way to actually describe it would be to use mathematics, to use, to use geometry and maths. Using equations, you can pretty much decide it, but then you still have to transfer that design, be it in geometry or just in maths, into a physical object, some analog form of, of manufacturing. While the point I will now make certainly necessitate, necessitates a full and very formal substantiation, I feel it would simply be cowardly of me not to bring this argument to its logical conclusion and stand by where the evidence and logic leads. As, of, as far as we know, no human beings, trained animals, or naturally occurring phenomena, modern or ancient, take mathematical formulae and equations as input and produce lathe operating motions as outputs. So, right? Remember this. So, you've designed this thing with maths. 
how do you then take that mass and get it into some sort of manufacturing process that creates motions and movements to create it as an output? For all of the knowledge and insights we have accumulated over the ages, we know of exactly one and only one category of things capable of such behavior, the kind of thing that we refer to as a Turing machine, a device capable of taking input, holding state, performing operations on held states according to predetermined principles and producing output. They come in many shapes and sizes and can be constructed mechanically, electronically, and even pneumatically or hydraulically. And you are most likely using one right now to read this article or to watch the stream. We call this class of device a computer, and no plausible way of representing, operating on, or manufacturing the design of this artifact exists without having access to one such. That's what he's talking about. Like, that's the conclusion you come to with this artifact and the fact that it is can be best represented with a mathematical equation, and then the fact that somebody took that equation and turned it into an, an analog output in stone the only way to do that's with a computer. And this thing's at least 5,000 years old. So what's going on? And then he gets into the manufacturing capabilities, right? So you have massive issues with just being able to manufacture this thing so precisely. But but this is this is a fundamental conclusion that 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 you come to with by analyzing this and, and in his work is that it just you know, you, you, we've left the, the concept of handmade and pounded stone shit so far behind us. We're now at the point of, of requiring a f***ing computer to actually create this thing. And even then, it would be significant challenge. Oh, I think it's older than 5,000 years for sure. I said at least. I think it's well and truly older than 5,000 years. But then you have all these issues with the actual manufacturing capabilities, right? When comparing the output of our generative model to the physical object, we can begin to get some rough insights into the fabrication capabilities of the creators of the object. From only looking at the observable facts, we can conclude the following. Since we have no known records of or even ideas about how an additive manufacturing process with granite could work, we are assuming a subtractive process. So it's not 3D printed, it's cutted, carved, granded, ablated, blah, blah, blah. The creators of the object were able to consistently hold tolerances of around 30 micrometers for subtractive processes in granite. In many places, we see tolerances of less than 10 micrometers. Tools used to subtract material from the granite blank must have been held at incredibly high levels of axial stability to reach these tolerances. Technolog technologically, this is only possible to achieve with ultra-smooth and precise rods, bearings, ball screws, and similar mechanisms. Incredibly precise guiding mechanisms must have been employed to control the subtract, subtractive process. So it's something had to go. So it's not just you have to hold the tool, you have to hold the piece of stone, and then something needs to guide the cutting or the whatever the process is that they're using to shape it. Since the finished object conforms to the abstract abstract design to microscopic levels of precision. Again, this absolutely requires mechanical technology of ultra high quality, rivaling or surpassing what we are able to produce today. We can observe no perceivable loss in calibration or positioning across curves of different radii or their positional interrelation to each other, which most likely means that the creators of the object were able to machine it in a single pass or could somehow carry out tool changes, tool changes with practically no loss of positional calibration. It's one of the issues that Alex Dunn and Nick Sierra talked about is that even in our very best machines today, when you do a tool change, it introduces errors. You, it's unavoidable. It's it's a it's a it's a consequence of using the systems that we use today, and we just don't see that in this. So either this was made in one pass, <laughs> or they had a, a system that was better than ours in terms of handling tool changes and not losing you know whatever he called positional calibration. The placement of the exterior features of the object and the maintenance of precision across the areas between the handles means that a simple rotational process would have been insufficient to produce the geometry you see. One pass with the handles. Well, and then his, this last statement is basically saying that a simple rotational process would have been insufficient to produce the geometry. Basically saying this can't have been made on a simple lathe. The most simple manufacturing process we have been able to come up with for the object would require five axes of freedom in the system guiding the subtractive tools, a five axis mill, basically. So, conclusions in summary, 
The object was fabricated on a highly sophisticated subtractive manufacturing system from a solid piece of granite. The manufacturing system would require, at, at the very least, sophisticated mechanical technology and high precision components. The manufacturing system would necess necessarily have been guided by an automated control system, which could read the designer's input and produce the required motions as output. That a Turing machine of considerable sophistication would most likely have been employed to create and operate on the design and to finally transfer it to the manufacturing system. This is this is significant. Like th this is you have to understand what what you know is being said here, and and it's backed up by data. Like anyone that has the background and knowledge, like this, like Mark does as a cryptographer, a mathematician, and a machinist, because he 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 works with five axis mills as well. We're basically saying that this thing represents proof that it that it had to have been made with a very sophisticated manufacturing process and it it had to have been designed had it and then had its design transferred to the manufacturing system using a computer right we're a long way from rubbing on rock with sand and water you know and and hammering on it with 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 flint chisels so this is this is i i, I want to find a consistent and concise way of 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 communicating what he's shown in this article. I think we went through it now. Hopefully you guys get it, right? Because I had to read it a few times to get it. Um, and I, I can't pretend that I understand all the fucking maths in here, right? I'm not this thing, okay, you know, not a mathematician. A long time since I've attempted anything like this. I mean, not, you know, I mean, if I wanted to try and bust my way through it, I probably could eventually, but uh, I, I understand what he's saying in a lot of this, even if I'm not like, doing the math directly but for people that want to do the math like it's it's all there all the data is there like you can this stuff is back is is supported um and here's the other thing that i that, I, that i'll say about this vase and i'll probably wrap it up pretty here pretty soon is uh it's extremely unlikely that we've hit a unicorn on the first try right this is but this is the first vase that we've scanned and analyzed to this level the first one we know there's like 50,000 plus of these things that are pre-dynastic and early dynastic. Like that's where they're attributed. I'm pretty sure they're all a bit older, right? And they stopped there kind of in the, in the archaeological record because they were all collected, I think, at that point. But this is the very first one we've looked at. And at least to the eye, and you go and look at objects in the museum, a lot of them look very similar to this. That A lot of them seem to have similar proportions, similar precision, you know, uh, there's a, there's the more rounded shape and then there's this shape. You, you see you see vases in two different shapes, and I think it's very unlikely that we hit a unicorn on the first try. So what I'm saying is I think if we can improve, if we can widen our data set, analyze more of these vases, and and show that there's I, th I think it it becomes very difficult to argue because the only argument people have ever made about this vase is like provenance, saying that oh it's a replica somebody made this. And I think he's also shown that it would be incredibly difficult to even attempt making something like this today. And we pro we're not even sure we could do it to the level of precision that's shown in this vase today. It, it may surpass even our capabilities to make in granite. I don't think it's possible to overemphasize just how remarkable these results, or the vase itself, truly are. Not only are we looking at something that is a true masterpiece of machining, carved from solid granite with utter precision down to the micrometer, something that would present a true challenge to replicate even today, but it's also not simply just a vase. I could only speculate as to its true intended purpose. Perhaps it was functional or has undiscovered attributes. Perhaps it was part of something larger. Or perhaps it was truly an expression of artistic capability and a mastery of mathematics and geometry. An unavoidable elephant in the room conclusion of this study is that the most efficient way to design the vase is via mathematics, and the only way known to our civilization to transfer such a design into analog output in a manufacturing system is via a computer, and a fairly sophisticated one at that. Even if it were designed on paper, the minute features, like curves from circles with a one millimeter or less radius, circles that fit the radial traversal pattern, and are expressed with utter precision in the real granite of the real object, make such an exercise impossible without the aid of a computer. 
Perhaps it goes without saying, but we've left the very concept of achieving this via handwork with primitive tools far, far behind. The precision of relative geometry is one thing, but the sheer level of mathematical interrelation between the base circle sections comprising components of the vase and the expression of pi and the golden ratio in the object could only have been achieved by a very sophisticated mechanism guiding whatever was actually cutting the stone. Note also that unless this ancient machining system had a superior methodology for handling tool changes than our very best machines do, then it was most likely created in a single pass. We're talking about a five-axis mill with utterly remarkable stability and precision, able to shape one of the most difficult materials on the planet. I also want to briefly mention the concept of what's called sacred geometry by many who are familiar with it, as shown in the artifact with the repeated flower of life grids or the appearance of pi and phi. This category is not some crystal hippie woo, as I've seen some disreputable skeptics of this work try to frame it, but is rather exactly as described. Within the bounds of so-called sacred geometry lie the secrets of the universe, the interrelation of objects from the workings of atoms and molecules, to the ratios expressed by DNA and life itself, to the motions of planets, star systems and galaxies. It is the very stuff of our existence, and to dismiss these findings by trying to brand it some sort of esoteric nonsense is, simply put, intellectual weak source. The mathematics of the people who created this artifact is sophisticated and elegant. Perhaps it was a base radian or a base pi system, as opposed to our own base 10. The radian is certainly shown as being important. I didn't cover this in the clip, but the placement of the handles is precisely calculated by the use of exactly one radian angles, and Mark explained the math behind it in detail in his article. If, indeed, this was the basis for a mathematical system, it is one that seems tightly coupled to the very nature of the universe we live in, and demonstrates a harmony of deep knowledge and fundamental principles of physics, which is why I can confidently state that this artifact is far more than a simple vase. It tells a story, a story about the sophistication, knowledge, elegance, capabilities and prowess of its creators, and it's written in stone for those with the eyes to decipher it. If you want to check the work and replicate the results for yourself, the scan results, Mark's CAD model based on the algorithms, and his workings are all available to you. In some ways, this small granite artifact may well exceed even the great heights of our own civilization's abilities. Truly, these people were complete masters of their craft. One analogy put to me by Nick Sierra while discussing this article on the phone struck me as apt. In some ways, the vase is similar to the golden record fixed to the side of the Voyager spacecraft, launched in 1977 and today still hurtling away from Earth in interstellar space. On the side of it is a golden record, with pictures and mathematics depicting our species, our technology, capability and location. It even uses electroplated uranium-238 with its steady radioactive decay as a launch clock. Analysis of the vase is revealing similar secrets about its creators, and who knows what there is yet to find. While Voyager, with its golden disk, was sent through space, the vase, with its encoded messages, has been sent through time. So, as I said in the clip, I think it's extremely unlikely that we have hit upon a unicorn with the very first vase we scanned. From visual observation, I suspect many more similar artifacts that I've viewed in museums might yield similar results, and I'm sure there is much yet to uncover. We are working to scan more objects like these, and some of those efforts are currently underway. I am still very interested in anyone who has access to such artifacts and is willing to have them scanned or analysed. And we have several irons in the fire, so to speak. But if you are such a person, please do reach out. I want to say thank you to everybody who has. I've had many responses from private collectors, from people in laboratories with scanning equipment, from machinists or other people volunteering their time. I've just returned from a month of travels, and my apologies as I haven't been able to respond to everyone. But I will be, as I'm currently collating all of the offers and trying to put some more structure behind this effort, so please do bear with me. I'll be talking about this project and the vase in more detail at the upcoming Cosmic Summit event, held in Asheville, North Carolina next month, June 17 and 18. 
In-person tickets to the event are still available and we'll also be live streaming all the content if you're interested in checking it out but can't be there in person. The link to purchase the live stream is below in the description and as I get a slice of live stream sales, buying it via that link does help out this channel. If you want the chance to visit Egypt with me this year, I will be joining Yusuf Awan on his primordial Egypt trip late in October with some spots still available and the link to that is below. Myself and the Snake Bros are currently putting together plans for an Egypt trip around February 2024. It's going to be a good one. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned to my social media as I expect to announce it in the coming weeks. As for me, I've just returned from a month of travel, including a great trip to Turkey, visiting sites like Gobekli and Karahan Tepe for the first time, and now it's back to business and making content. I've got a few videos in the works, and I want to say a huge thank you to my patrons, channel members and supporters. You'll be seeing more out of me in the coming weeks. I work on the value for value model, so if you've got some value from my work and you want to return some of that to me, there's lots of ways to do it. They're all outlined on my website at unchartedx.com support. I hope everyone out there is doing well, and I'll see you all in the next one.